Hi, my name is Sandy Simpson, and I want to uh, do a DVD today that is uh, taken from an article I wrote called What We Need is a Reverse Paradigm Shift. Now, paradigm shift is a word that was used a lot in the third wave in New Apostolic Reformation. In other words, they want to change people's worldview. Well, I'm going to warn you now, I'm going to let you in on some information that's going to radically change your worldview. And you're likely going to experience the beginnings of a reverse paradigm shift. And after you hear this, there will be no way back the way you came. You'll be faced with choices that you may never have known you had. You'll be faced with a new way of looking at things that's going to cause you to rethink everything that's being taught in uh, a lot of churches today, for instance, emerging church and latter rain uh, doctrines. It's going to be radical because the basis for this message doesn't come from Jesus Christ visiting my room last night bodily, but from his holy written word. So buckle down your seatbelts, you're likely for a bumpy ride. Matthew 7, 15 through 23 says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You know, uh, let's mold Jesus Christ into our own postmodern, subjectivist, self-absorbed image for a moment to illustrate a point. After all, don't Christians do that to Jesus in today's churches as a matter of routine? The difference is that we will do it to prove a point. Let's see what our new purpose-driven Jesus, our emerging Jesus, would say in response to these claimants before his throne. Well, you call me Lord. The Bible says that those who confess the name of the Lord are born again, Romans 10, 10 9. You've apparently met the, that criteria, so you're in. You worship me by, using, uh, by saying my name twice. Lord, Lord, you said. I've heard you repeating my name many times. Such as, more, Lord. More, 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 Lord. Fire, 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 fire. Power, 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 power. Glory, 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 glory. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Your worship is powerful. By repeating my name more than once, you're forcing me to accept your sacrifice of praise and to act on your demands. You've declared it on earth, and so it shall be in heaven. You're in. You prophesied in my name. You didn't get all your prophecies right, but you got some correct, and every correct prophecy comes from the Lord. You told people over and over again on a daily basis that you were a prophet of the Lord. And some would not believe you. But some of your prophecies came true. That proves you're a true believer, and since you have some good fruit, you're in. You cast out demons? <laughs> no one can cause demons to leave a person or a place unless they're of God. A demon's not going to leave unless he's ordered to do so by someone in authority. You claimed you could bind demons, bring down territorial spirits, stomp on Satan, and defeat the enemy. The fact that your claims were exaggerated does not mean that someone may have been delivered from demonic activity for a time. So, since there's some truth to your claim, you're in. You did miracles in my name? <laughs> Enough said. Any miracles from God. I'm going to overlook the fact that uh, a number of your miracle claims were wishful thinking at best and bragging at worst. But some of them were real. I saw the tumor the size of a grapefruit shrink to the size of a pea. I saw fire come down from heaven. So, on that basis, 
the miracles that you've done, I, I'm going to let you in. You're in by popular demand. All in all, you were not perfect. You made some mistakes, but we need to get back. Uh, we need to <clears throat> pick out the bones and get to the good meat. There were lies mixed in with the good, but the good is what I am looking for. The good works you did outweighed the bad. Your clothes are dirty, but we've got a whole new wardrobe waiting for you on the other side. So I'll just put you through the security portal over there, which will burn off your filthy rags, your false prophecies, your false teachings, your lying signs and wonders, your bragging, your lying, your cheating, your stealing, and all your other unrepentant sins, because in the end, you called me Lord. Gabriel, escort them, uh, them over through the checkpoint. Don't worry, it's going to sting a bit, but on the other side, you'll be admitted into paradise. Bon voyage! So the whole generation of claimants, happy and vindicated that they have been, what they've been claiming and bragging about all over television, in print, in crusades, and anywhere else, uh, that they could get on a soapbox, has caused them to be accepted into heaven and go marching into a greater spiritual escapades. And they all lived happily ever after. The end. True story? Yeah, right. Let's look at what the true historical God-man Jesus Christ has to say on Judgment Day. He clearly warned us ahead of time to watch out for false prophets. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. What's their fruit, by the way? Well, first of all, they do not bear true uh, spiritual fruit, but bad carnal fruit. Thus Jesus says that bad trees with bad fruit will be cut down and burned. Then Jesus goes on to show what they believe their fruit to be and what Jesus says is not true fruit. What? You mean there can be prophecy, deliverance, and miracles that are not true fruit? Let's look at their petition before Jesus Christ. They said, Lord... Now, just because a person names the name of Jesus does not make them a true believer. There are many false religions in the world today that name the name of Jesus, but whose participants are on their way to hell without the hope of the gospel. For instance, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Moonies, Muslims, Jews, Roman Catholics, uh, Unity, uh, uh, International Church of Christ, etc. The, the list goes on and on. These are a few of the recognized cults and religions that call Jesus Lord. But we can also include the unrecognized cults, which are cults nonetheless, including Word of Faith, Latter Rain, Oneness Pentecostals, Manifest Sons of God, etc. But notice the basis upon which these claimants think they will be accepted. When you think about it, it's actually works. They, seem, they think they simply need to name the name of the Lord and they're in. They think if they proclaim their Christians with their lips, regardless of whether they have really been born again or are living in obedience to the Lord, then they must be accepted as Christians. But that's not the basis upon which the Lord accepts us. The Father only accepts, uh, accepts us if we are found in Christ. Romans 8, 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, to be in Christ, we must have understood the true gospel and accepted it. Many people who call themselves Christians today have been included into the fellowship of believers on the basis of a false gospel. And, you know, often that gospel goes something like this. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Even though you've made mistakes in life and are not perfect like the rest of us, God loves you. He will give you eternal life if you just accept his free gift. Just accept that gift. Pray a simple prayer, and you're in. And then, of course, many continue. Then come forward, be slain in the Spirit, so you can get the Holy Spirit from us by the laying on of hands. Just because you say you're a Christian, you may not have the Holy Spirit, and we can transfer him to you. Oh, and by the way, give us all your money. Those who preach this have not presented the true gospel at any point. Yet now the person who has believed this false gospel claims to be a Christian. And they get offended if you ask them to prove they are a believer or point, to, you know, point out to them that they're not. 
They were told they were now saved based on this defective gospel that's actually devoid of the gospel facts. You know, if you want to present the true gospel, take a look at Romans Road, which has been often used. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Very important part of the gospel. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in, Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8.1, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 10.9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And finally, Romans 10, 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But aren't the claim claimants before the judgment seat calling on the name of the Lord? Never mind that it's too late to call on his name, but at least they're doing so at the end. But if you look at their fruit, you realize the sad fact is they never really called on his name in their lives. They used his name, but they had no real relationship to him. They were never in Christ. You know, there's only one basis on which the Father will accept people. It is if they have been crucified with Christ and no longer live and are living in Christ. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Furthermore, these people say, Lord, Lord. They like to repeat things. These claimants who are really false believers and false leaders in the churches believe they'll be accepted because of their worship, their repetitive worship. If they just repeat enough worship songs over and over again until they enter a spirit of bliss or a trance state, then they believe they'll be accepted. If they just repeat prayers over and over again until they get their desired result, then that proves they ought to be accepted. If they just declare, summon, invoke, and tell the Lord what to do enough times with enough people, and then something happens that they ask for, they believe that God is with them and they will be accepted because of it. What they don't realize is that they have been sorely mistaken. God does not want vain repetitions. Matthew 6, 6 through 8. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. God does not want people bossing Him around. He's sovereign. Psalms 95, 6-7a says, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Romans 14, 11-12, It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. 2 Peter 2, 1, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction, destruction on themselves. Now, one way to deny the sovereign Lord Jesus Christ is to treat him as though he's not sovereign. We're seeing that today all over Christian television. Name it and claim it. Positive confession. Positive thinking. Any doctrine that attempts to degrade or destroy the sovereignty of God is a destructive heresy and will end up bringing swift destruction to those who practice such things. Now, if you don't think that heretics like Benny Hinn are going to get swift destruction, wait till Judgment Day. He and every other false teacher like him will receive swift destruction. In two sentences, these are the sentences you never want to hear. God says, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Poof! A life wasted and up in flames. Swift enough for you? Just, before, just be sure Jesus doesn't cast his eyes on you 
and say the same thing. How can you be sure that will not happen? Well, one way is to stop following false teachers. You know, if you get in your car and you follow me and I go to my house, you'll end up at my house. If you follow a false teacher, you're going to end up where he is going. If you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll end up with him. They also say, did we not prophesy in your name? Just because a person prophesies in the name of Jesus Christ does that not mean it's true. Countless thousands today make prophecies in the name of the Lord that do not come to pass. Now, there are three types of predictive prophecy. And I've written about this in an article that was called There Are Three Types of tr Predictive Prophecy That Can Come True Sometimes. There's only one type of predictive prophecy that comes true all the time. So there are, number one, predictions made based on human intuition and analysis of facts. And there are, number two, predictions made by information from demonic sources. And there are, number three, true prophetic words from God the first two types have limited success. The second type has better success because demons have a better chance of guessing the future than human beings do. Since the devil and his angels have been around since before the fall of man, they have added advantage of a historical point of view. They have been listening in on private conversations and plans. They can be in many places around the world because of their numbers and relay that information to individuals who are open to their leading. But even though they have all this information, they still get future predictions wrong because they're not omniscient like God. This is why it's imperative to test all prophecies that are ascribed to God. I got news for you. True prophets are 100% correct. And their prophecies are 100% accurate. Because they have the spirit of truth and have really heard from God. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or a wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, if it takes place, and he says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. This basically discounts the people of the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People movement because they're bringing people to worship their former supreme beings. Deuteronomy 18.20, But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. Notice from Deuteronomy 13 that false prophets can do signs and wonders. We'll get into that in a moment. We are to test prophets, and if they are lying in the name of the Lord, they are to be rejected if they do not repent. In any case, God does not accept people into heaven based on prophecies they've made that are accurate. He only accepts those who are in Christ again. Now remember that any true prophecy, the, the Holy Spirit speaks to His church through the written word, which is the final revelation. And any time the word is actually being truly exegeted, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to his church, that's prophecy. They also say, did we not in your name drive out demons? Well, first, just because a person uses the name of Jesus Christ does not guarantee success in driving out demons. Case in point, Acts 19, 13 through 16, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, they drove out evil spirits, by the way, tried to invoke the name of, Jesus, of Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a uh, Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Very dangerous stuff. Now we learned two important points. Uh, two important things, among other points from this story. One is that these Jewish false believers were already in the business of driving out evil spirits. Apparently, they had a limited success doing so. The second thing we learn is that the name of Jesus Christ alone is not sufficient to drive out a demon. 
True casting out of demons by rebuking them in the name of Jesus is based on whether the person doing the rebuking has a relationship to Jesus Christ. Again, whether or not they are in Christ. All important. The fact is that there are a vast number of rituals, chants, and methods in the occult for ridding people of demons. Sometimes they work. How could they work? It's because demons like to fool people. They can agree to leave a person or stop bothering a person for a time to lend validity to the claims of a shaman. They love to play shell games. I've seen this experientially on the mission field. A person goes to a shamanic uh, healer for relief from an illness brought on by a curse, usually demonically caused in the first place. The shaman removes the curse and they're better for a while. Uh-oh, then something bad or worse happens again and the cycle starts all over. This is a game that the enemy likes to play with people to enslave them. To us, the difference between what a shaman does and what a true believer does may look quite similar, but they're not. When a Christian rebukes a demon in the name of the Lord, and if the, that Christian has a true relationship to the Lord, Jesus Christ, that demon leaves against its will and is not permitted to return. The person is then free to commit to the Lord Jesus Christ. When a person is freed of a demon by a shaman, Christian shaman or otherwise, they may indeed be freed for a while, but that freedom does not lead to obedience to the Lord, but leads to further problems with the enemy. Luke 11, 24-26, When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes, goes and gets and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse, worse than the first. This is why you see so many so-called Christians having to go back time and time and again to latter rain false teachers for deliverance. You know, if they were true believers, they would claim the sonship relationship they have in Christ who bought the victory for them over the devil at the cross. That's true spiritual warfare. But they cannot because they are not in Christ. They're in something else. They're often in another spirit, frankly. The fact of the matter is, not only are these false teachers and a whole generation who follow them not really casting out demons, they're bringing people under the influence of another spirit and calling it the Holy Spirit. If you've ever been to any third wave meetings where slain in the spirit is being done, you'll know what I'm talking about. I stood up front in the Brownsville meetings on Guam with a man uh, from Brownsville, one of the first people who got slain in the spirit by Steve Hill on Father's Day 1995 at Brownsville in Florida. And I watched as nine of the core people of Brownsville, plus others who had been there and received the transferable impartation, laid hands on people at the meeting. Subsequently, most of those who, laid, uh, who they laid hands on, who were receptive, fell down backwards and began to exhibit all manner of manifestations such as uncontrolled laughter, drunkenness, screaming, moaning, crying, shaking, jerking, doubling over in pain, and vomiting. When I saw this, I approached some of the Brownsville people and told them I thought many had been demonized and that they needed help. But they told me this, mark this, they said, oh no, the Holy Spirit is all over them. I was appalled because I have seen a fair amount of demonization in my life, and that's what I was seeing that night. They insisted it was the work of the Holy Spirit and was a blessed event, and that I would have to experience it to understand how good it was. But the Lord helped me to come to another understanding. I want you to understand that it was entirely the work of the Holy Spirit in my life that protected me and brought me back to the Word of God to look to see what it said about these things. It was not too long before I came to the biblical realization that slain in the Spirit was not taught or done by the apostles, that the manifestations were indeed demonic and not of the Spirit of Truth, and that there is no such thing as a transferable impartation that is of the Holy Spirit. I then came to the realization that a whole generation of latter rain Christians 
now believe they are dispensing the Holy Spirit when in fact they're opening people up to demonization. Now I'm not saying that everyone I saw was demonized or that everyone exposed to slaying the Spirit has been demonized. But I am saying it gives the enemy a foothold. And those who really received something were not receiving the Holy Spirit. Therefore they were receiving another spirit. I came to realize that this is the spirit of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were nature we were by nature objects of wrath. I realized with a stark realization that these people were following the cravings of the sinful nature and mistaking it for something godly and spiritual. The great delusion is that many Lateran Christians are now not only not helping to free people from demonic spirits, but are actually helping demonic spirits enslave people. How can you tell the difference between the Holy Spirit and a demonic spirit who is influencing a person? Well, one of the prime tests is the test of truth. My long experience with latter rain heretics and their followers who have opened themselves to another spirit is that when they are confronted with facts, they either ignore them, hide the truth, or simply lie. By their false prophecies, lying sons and wonders, false teachings, false casting out of demons, and lies, you will know that their father is not the father of the spirit of truth, but the father of lies. John 8, 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would, uh, you would love me, for I came from God, and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. John 14, 23-24, Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. John 8, 43-44 says, Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he speaks lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So the delusion that those who stand before Jesus Christ on Judgment Day are under is that they cast out demons, when actually it's just the opposite. They were helping demons by disobeying the Lord, in using occult techniques like slaying the spirit, doing occult things like spiritual mapping and binding territorial spirits, and using witchcraft to try to command God to do their bidding. And again, God does not accept people into heaven based on casting out demons. He only accept those, accepts those who are in Christ. Furthermore, they say, did we not in your name perform many miracles? You know, many miracles are happening today, not just in Christian circles, but in other cults and religions around the world. I watched a TV program the other night on a woman who claims to have empathetic, uh, empathic abilities and, tries, uh, and ties to demonic spirit guys. And they hooked her up in a hospital in Japan and tested her on a number of instruments. In front of their eyes, she shrank a large tumor in a patient down to a very small size. You know, this is medically documented. Now, if Benny Hinn could do that, he would have the proof he needs to debunk Dateline NBC's claims against him of fraud and continue to mislead and swindle millions of people. But he can't even manage the level of healing of this New Age shaman. Was the shrinking of that tumor a divine healing from God? No. People of every nation and people group have been doing are going to shamans for miracles for thousands of years. They go to them because they have a certain success rate, not because they're complete charlatans. And often uh, they have a higher success rate than even American medicine or Christian faith healers. Why is it that the, we ascri ascribe healings to God in Benny Hinn meetings, but do not ascribe shamanic healings to Jesus? 
because Hin claims he's healing people with the power of God. Of course, many shamans also claim the same thing. But when Hin's success rate is so low that he cannot even produce one documented evidence for Dateline NBC, and in, the fact Dateline, and in fact Dateline documented that many people have died at his crusades, what does that say about the power of Benny Hinn's quote-unquote God? It's a very poor testimony before the world, I have to tell you. The fact is that Hinn is just as much a shaman as those on TV and not a very good one. He has lots of paranormal power to knock people over, but very little power to heal. But what if someday someone actually gets healed on the Benny Hinn Show? Does that prove Hinn is a man of God? Sorry, but no. It is proof of nothing. This is because Hinn's miracles, quote unquote, as well as those of other shamans, do not meet biblical criteria to be biblically divine, biblically divine he healings. To definitively prove that a healing is a biblical divine healing today, that healing would have to meet the following biblical criteria. It would have to be number one, of an incurable condition, number two, obvious to all, number three, completely verifiable, number four, a problem well known to many people, number five, immediate, number six, lasting, and number seven, ascribed alone to the glory of God, who accomplished it by his omnipotent power alone. Now, if a healing does not meet all these criteria, it should not be used to prove it is a type of biblically divine uh, healing. If it does not meet all the biblical criteria, it's not a divine healing, but it's some other type of healing. Now, if you accept that every sign and wonder is from God, then you would have to conclude that God is working in every religion, trying to save cultures, religions, and nations. Well, that's exactly what the latter rain New Apostolic Reformation and organizations like YWAM, First Nations, and the World Gathering of Indigenous Peoples are claiming. But if you realize that false prophets can do signs and wonders, and the devil is perfectly capable, capable of a great deal of what we see as miraculous uh, things, you realize that the enemy is at work not only in false religions but in many Christian circles. This is simply leading a whole generation of Christians to the point where they will be fooled by the false prophet and the Antichrist who will do many wondrous things. Remember what the false prophet will do, Revelation 13:13, 13, 13. And he, the false prophet, the second beast, performed great and miraculous signs even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. But what does Jesus say? I will plainly tell them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Here comes the reverse paradigm shift that I've been talking about. All the information that I've given you up to this point is leading to this dose of reality. We need to fully understand how God views false prophets and false teachers. He does not view them as being just good enough to enter paradise. He does not view their teaching as having good points that outweigh the bad points. He does not tell his people to pick out the bones and eat the meat and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. He does not view their false prophecies as being godly enough, though partly in error, to merit them eternal life. He does not view their claims of delivering people from demons as credible. In fact, he sees what they have been facilitating in the demonic realm. He does not view miracles they may or may not have done as proving their obedience to him. We as believers have to understand the nature of false prophets. God calls them, quote unquote, evildoers. They clearly have no real relationship with God. Now, how are we to know these people? He tells us, by their fruit. Well, what is that fruit, according to Matthew 7, 15-23? It's not how many followed them or how big their church was. They are not tested on the basis of experiences or manifestations people received at their hands or because those experience may, experiences may have felt really good. They're not tested on the basis of the feelings and emotions of their followers. They're not judged by the validity of their claims to be men of God based on 
the numbers of their followers, numbers of people who claimed to have been saved by them, the size of their church or movement, subjective testimonies, hearsay and rumors their followers promote attempting to legitimize their ministries, how successful and rich they were, whether or not they spoke with authority, or how blessed the atmosphere of their meetings were. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 15-23 that he tests them by the following criteria. Number one, are they in Christ or trying to be justified by their works? Number two, was their worship a hollow repetition instead of worship based on obedience? Number three, were their prophecies true or false? Number four, were they driving out demons or opening the door to demonic oppression? Number five, were they doing true divine miracles or were they miracles of another spirit? Number six, and finally, from beginning to end, are they in Christ or do they not really know him? When you apply this test to many who claim to be Christian leaders today, you will often be brought to the same conclusion Jesus Christ does. Number one, he does not know them because they are not really saved or have fallen away. Number two, by their works, it's plain they are evildoers. Can you see that false prophets and false teachers are evildoers? You know, it's going to take a reverse paradigm shift, a complete worldview change for you to see this because our culture has taught us otherwise. I believe that you cannot come to any other conclusion when you look at the biblical facts. I came to the conclusion that latter rain heretics are evildoers, and because they clearly do not know the Lord, then they are not my brothers in the Lord. I'm sorry to say it. Be careful who you hang out with. I'm duty-bound to witness to them, but I must also mark and avoid them until they repent, until they repent and return to Jesus Christ. Of course, I will pray for them, but I will warn others to avoid them because they're rejected by Christ. I will not listen to them or hang around them uh, because they're not because they're not just pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. They're deceive, deceived and deceiving others. Second Timothy 3.13 says, While evil men and impostors go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. They are evildoers, and I, as a follower of Christ, have no part in them. They are part of the coming global church of the world, the woman who rides the beast. The Spirit and the Bride say this, Revelation 18.4-8, then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she is given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the, as the glory and the luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Don't be caught up in the broad road that leads to hell, populated by latter rain false teachers and false prophets. Get on the narrow way and stay there away from the influences of quote-unquote evildoers. Mm -hmm.